everybody. So we are here, Dr. Zuleta here, and I have an awesome guest here, Dr. Deanna Minnick. And um, Dr. Dr. Minnick, it's so great to have you here. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? You bet. Uh, so I am a nutrition scientist by training. So I have a PhD in medical sciences and a master's degree in human nutrition and metabolism. So all along the way, my focus has been on nutrition. I have also worked with Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who is the father of functional medicine. So I worked with him for about 11 years. And then I would say from that point on, you know, I'm a teacher at the Institute for Functional Medicine. So I teach as part of the environmental health module. And I would say, you know, I have six books, so I'm an author as well. One of the things I really love to do is to teach people about food, their environment. And one of the things that I connect into is not a dietary approach, but one that is more around colors and making eating fun and connecting those colors to phytonutrients, which have functionality in the body. So the way I got into melatonin, because you could say, well, what does melatonin have to do with any of that? <laughs> um, I a couple of things. First of all, during the pandemic, I began to notice that much of the literature was coming out looking at vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, quercetin, and also melatonin. So that piqued my interest. Like, what is it about melatonin that makes it good for the immune system? So I began reading much more about melatonin. I joined a company in 2022 called Symphony Natural Health, and they have a plant melatonin. Then I wrote a review article uh, together with the team, and we published that in the Nutrients Journal in September of 2022. In fact, I just got an email yesterday that it was just chosen as part of the editor's choice. That article has had so much, um, mm -hmm. you know, people are just really going to it. It feels like there's something that people really needed to know about melatonin mm -hmm. because in the paper we talk about, you know, is melatonin like vitamin D? Vitamin D is about the sun. Melatonin is about the night or, or the darkness. Mm hmm and I can't wait to get into the weeds of the melatonin. And before we go into that, what got you interested in like nutrition? What was like the thing that kind of sparked your interest in to nutrition? My mom. My mom, you know, very simply, uh, you know, what can I say when I was growing up in the 1970s? So I'm almost 53. And at the time I was growing up, I was like eight, nine years old during the 1970s. And my mom was a health nut, literally, like she would be now she she's cool. But then she was not cool. You know, she was like an outlier. She right. was one of those early adopters. You know, Dr. Bland might say that's the bleeding edge more than the leading edge. But actually, Dr. Bland's mom was the same way. So it's kind of interesting. But, you know, she was really into eating well, living well. She was into her faith. So there was something for her around food and faith. It's kind of like, you know, body is the temple. And so, and she was also pregnant with my brother. And I think sometimes when women are focused on, you know, when they're pregnant, they start thinking, oh my goodness, like, what am I eating? Is the, you know, at that time, cigarette smoking was like the norm, even when you were pregnant. Yeah. So, you know, for my mom, she was like, what is all of this? We can't be doing all of this. So my brother got the best end of it all because he, I, for me, it didn't start until I was about eight years old. Wow. That's crazy. Yes, you're right. I mean, the, uh, the, the commercials that you see, of the smoking and, and the doctors recommending smoking. I mean, it's crazy how that all goes together. And I think you're right. I think a, a lot of the uh, the interest around melatonin is interesting that it's kind of blowing up or not blowing up, but just expanding people's awareness of it because I think it ties to, it ties to light, it ties to dark, which we are all depleted in both in a weird way. And then it ties to our circadian rhythm, which we're all kind of, trying to figure that out too and then it ties into serotonin too and so yeah. it has so many um so many links and so as you are as you are writing this paper tell us a little bit about a, a review paper and what that means for you know if somebody's interested in writing a review paper how how, how is that process that they, that they that they go through 
you ha it's like a little mini PhD. You have to dive into the literature and look mm -hmm. at all of the publications, synthesize them. And what I really wanted to do in this paper was show not just the science, but then also show the clinical translation. Like, why do people care? We can look at all of the science on melatonin, but if we can't apply it, I just feel like it's not as useful. So the article required that I needed to get into the literature pretty strongly and like just dive in. It, it was like a whole summer that I just kind of started reading because I knew nothing about melatonin. Absolutely. I wasn't even wow. taking it. I mean, I, I if I can see the where I am now versus where I was then, it's like night and day, you know, to use the circadian rhythm <laughs> analogy, like really seeing that there's something bigger beyond even food. And it is the rhythms that run us. You know, we've got, we, we usually think of the circadian rhythm, which is that 24 hour rhythm, but actually there are more. There's the circannual rhythm, which is the seasonal rhythm. So, you know, we're in the Northern hemisphere. So we just had that transition going from summer into autumn. That's huge. That's that right there is a massive rhythm. Then we also have even our birth date and our rhythm established by our birth date. So there's a great paper on autoimmune conditions and basically looking at how when you're born during the year can almost predispose or make you more subject to certain risks for certain diseases. And that might be because of melatonin and vitamin D levels in the body at that time, right? And then there's the lunar rhythm. I mean, think of how powerful the moon is, right? The moon actually also ties into not just menstrual cycles, not just, uh, you know, water, mood states and those rhythms, but also, you know, there was a study in a sleep lab without the interference of light or dark. And basically the researchers found that melatonin produced by the, the pineal gland in the brain was lower four days before and four days after a full moon, irrespective of seeing the moonlight or the sunlight. So, you know, I got to say, we are run by rhythms and we need to really honor nature if we want to come into healthy alignment. Definitely. Tell me a little bit about, uh, that's just so interesting. And I have so many questions about that because you're right. We are such a, uh, we're such creatures of our environment. And I think we're just beginning to learn even more about this. Um, and I know I, I love the work from Harvard University with the Human Exposome Project, where they're trying to quantify everything that is coming into us uh, and how it affects us. But I think you're so right. Even when we're born, and I mean, there are studies on even performance. Hockey players that are born at a certain year, at a certain month. Uh, you know, most of them can 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 have a better career or not. I mean, it, it, it's so crazy. And you mentioned the melatonin was produced on the pineal gland or or some of it. Can you tell us a little bit about where the different sources of melatonin, where, where is melatonin made? That's a great place to start because most people don't realize this. Yeah. First of all, melatonin is found in plants. It's found everywhere. So let me just first say that. And then melatonin is, if we look in plants, we find it in nuts and seeds, usually the reproductive portion of a plant, because melatonin in a plant acts as a growth factor. It is, oh. the, the pineal gland in humans is one of the first glands to form. And so it's really pivotal. And so... Um, Melatonin in plants, we also see it in animals. They produce it from the pineal gland like humans. And then in our bodies, so there are two major places where we see the production. First of all, it's everywhere. It's in the skin. It's in the eyes. It's in the brain. It's in breast milk. It's in uh, the, the mitochondria in high amounts. Like if we were just to zoom into the cell, we would find the most amount of, of melatonin in the mitochondria. But the two main places that most people think of is the pineal gland, which is a small endocrine gland right inside the middle of the head. It was referred to as the seat of the soul back in the 17th century by Rene Descartes, who, you know, there was already some acknowledgement of the pineal gland. And then the other place where we make a lot of melatonin is actually the gut. The gut makes 400 times 
the amount of melatonin the pineal gland does. However, they're a little bit different. They don't, the melatonin that's produced from the pineal gland is used for circadian rhythm regulation and modulation and sleep-wake cycle. Mm. The melatonin in the gut is used more as an autocrine or paracrine effect, not true endocrine, not to the same extent as the pineal gland. So what that means is that after a meal, typically postprandially, we have this release of melatonin by the, the intestinal cells. And that's typically being used within the cells or maybe around those cells. A little bit is getting in systemically, but that's not doing the same thing as the brain pineal gland. So there's a little bit, and, and we think that, you know, most likely the gastrointestinal uh, melatonin plays a role in motility of the gut, secretions of the gut, and may even help with the gut microbiome modulation. So it's doing, you know, a number of different things that are, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, melatonin has just long been with us. It's It's been referred to as an ancient molecule because when we, you know, if you think of single-celled organisms that became more um, aerobically uh, inclined and started taking in oxygen, they needed something to help to buffer from all of those free radicals and all of the damage that could occur from oxygen. Because oxygen is great, we need it for life, but it fuels oxidative phosphorylation within the mitochondria. And so melatonin is quenching a lot of that spray of light. And so it is I would say, you know, nicely termed the darkness hormone, but it actually is one of the most powerful antioxidants that we have in our bodies for that very reason. It's helping us to prevent aging, you know, the accelerated aging that can occur with so much of that free radical damage. And, you know, there are a lot of antioxidants, but melatonin is quite unique. You know, it's... um. It's even more effective than glutathione in quenching certain uh, free radicals like the hydroxyl radical. It is um, a bit more potent than vitamin E. You know, one molecule of melatonin can quench up to 10 free radicals. So it's it's pretty, pretty potent stuff. That's so interesting. And mo at a molecular level, how is it regulating the... Um, the different function that it has in the gut or the different function that it has in the brain? Is it just because of the surrounding molecules that trigger it into doing other things? Or is it actually a different type of molecule? It's not a different type of molecule. It's the identical molecule. And in fact, the kind of melatonin you find in a plant is the same melatonin in our body. So from a chemical um, composition, it's not different. So it's just a matter of where it's produced. You know, many times the function of a compound of a molecule is determined by its location, right? So lutein, another compound from plants in the brain, is may have different functions than when it's in the ovary or when it's in the skin. So sometimes it's the locational effect. But what we know very definitively from kind of the lineage of research is that the pineal gland melatonin is sent throughout the body systemically at night and it is connecting to the clock genes within the cells of the body and the liver is a major clock gene regulator as is the lungs as are the kidneys so you know there's something to be said for you know when you're asking about like why is it, you know, is it different? It's not different. It's just a matter of where it's being produced. Is it endocrine, autocrine, paracrine? Is it an antioxidant? Is it serving as an anti-inflammatory? You know, I think in science, so many of us want to slice and dice things. And we just say, you know, oh, vitamin C, antioxidant. Right. It's not just an antioxidant. It's what we call pleiotropic, right? Mm -hmm. We know that so many, just like vitamin D for a second, if we look at vitamin D, it was probably misnamed as a vitamin. You know, vitamin D kind of acts like a hormone. And it is very similar 
to melatonin. You know, they're both found in the skin. They're both connected to light and darkness. They both are immune regulators. So I would encourage all of us, you know, in the science medical field, to think that, you know, maybe we don't know the full breadth and expanse of a compound and all of its many functions. And melatonin is a mystery. It's such a complex, you know, it serves so many foundational functions in the body, but it's it's still kind of unraveling, like especially because so many people are really into aging and longevity, right? you know, and that's why you start hearing about melatonin in the biohacker world. And there are some animal studies showing that animals given melatonin live about 20% longer. So, you wow. know, that's just, that's that enough. <laughs> that little tidbit is enough to keep me taking my melatonin at night, my herbatonin. Yeah, because it's so interesting when you're mentioning what it does, that a lot of it is found on the mitochondria. Then it just makes you wonder, like, why do you feel better when you go to sleep? Like, what is happening? Of course, we know a lot of the neuroscience and a lot of the other science of sleep and everything. But at a molecular level, it seems like we're just beginning to understand that all of these molecules are, like, working hard yeah. throughout our sleep, doing things cleaning or getting rid of oxidative stress or i mean just making the cells function better um what are some of those things that are are there different functions that is playing during the day and during the night or or is it just kind of throughout the day is is a major antioxidant basically melatonin levels in our blood during the day are negligible we don't have mm -hmm. a lot they skyrocket at at night and they skyrocket at the peak of darkness. So I, I want to go back to what you said because I think it's really important for all of your listeners to know that sleep is so important because it's when we're cleaning things up in the brain. And melatonin is actually part of that process. So if you track some of the major antioxidants in the body, like glutathione, like superoxide dismutase, and some of the different enzyme systems, they peak at night. And that can also be when we have increased flux from the brain of things like beta amyloid metabolites, hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. A lot of these things come from the brain at night into what is called the glymphatic fluid. The glymphatic fluid is basically the lymphatic fluid that is associated with the glial cells. And so we have this interstitial fluid around the brain and with the changes when we sleep, this allows for greater convection and melatonin is actually part of that process. Not only is it peaking at night to help us with inflammation, to help us with antioxidant response, but it has neurotropic effects. It has neuroprotective effects. It's removing, you know, the way I see it, because I teach on detoxification, we often don't talk about brain detoxification. We talk about the liver, we talk about the gut, we talk about kidneys and skin, but actually the brain has to do its cleaning up. You know, there's like a washing of the brain and that, mm -hmm. that happens at night. So when mm -hmm. we shortcut our sleep, we're actually shortcutting our ability to remove and get those toxic compounds out of the brain that are actually associated with the risk for dementia. I mean, this is so, you know, one time somebody, I, I, I heard this speaker talk about mercury poisoning and all of this. And honestly, to be honest with you, my um, I'm pretty reluctant when I hear things, you know, like my scientific brain was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, what do you mean mercury poisoning? And then I went, just kind of picked my interest and I went deep into like Penn State has actually done a lot of work on this. And they noticed mercury levels as we age. And it goes up as we age. And I mean, the levels of mercury that they found in uh, in people, it was just outstanding. I mean, I, I, I wasn't expecting that at all. Because, you know, in the hospital, we never check for mercury levels. Right. We never check for any of this stuff. And even if you do, many of the times it's negative and you just, it's hard to put your head around it. But what they did is they actually did biopsies of the brain and looking at the cells themselves. And you can see the mercury inside the cells. I mean, I was just so 
impressed by that and impressed by how little we actually know how this is causing a lot of the effects. Uh, I remember when I interviewed Dr. Joseph Pizzorno, who's done a lot of the environmental uh, yeah. work and just his research about how all of this is tied to, you know, chronic diseases and all of this. It was just so eye opening. And now that you're mentioning about the sleep and so melatonin at night, not only is it um, at a molecular level, is it getting rid of the oxidation uh, molecularly? And then is it also a growth factor through through the brain? Did I hear you say at the beginning of our talk or or, or what's the research on, on, on that? Or And then the third question is how is it then showing into longevity? How How is that process working? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I like your crosstalk and how your neurons are working. So mm -hmm. first of all, let's, let's just back up for a second, because there are six different functions of melatonin, and all of them do connect to exactly what you're asking about. You're asking about aging, you're asking about oxidative stress in the brain, and you're asking me if it's a growth factor in the brain. So first and foremost, you know, we already covered off that it is a potent antioxidant. And the unique thing is that it flexes to being water soluble and fat soluble, whereas many other antioxidants are either just one or the other. So melatonin can flex. It's a very interesting molecule in that way. Secondly, it's anti-inflammatory, which can help with neuroinflammation. And we know that diseases of accelerated aging are connected to increased inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can quell the heat, and especially the heat at night, neurodegenerative processes, then I think, you know, we're going to be better off and we'll have less oxidative stress in the brain. And, you know, think of the brain. Most of your brain matter is fat, you know, we have fat heads, we have like 60% lipid in our brains. So it's going to be highly um, susceptible to going rancid, if you will. And so having something like melatonin being connected to that is, is important. Thirdly, it's a mitochondrial regulator. And we know that the mitochondria is like your divining rod to longevity. You can thank your mom for your mitochondria because most of the DNA for your mitochondria is coming from the maternal line. And so the way that you treat your mitochondria and the more that you proliferate it through muscle and other tissues, the more energy you're going to have. It's like you get energy currency, you get more longevity. Well, what is melatonin doing? It's actually regulating. It's produced in the mitochondria in high levels because that's where, too, it's also needed. It is um, also a chronobiotic, meaning that it plays a role in, as I talked about before, sleep-wake circadian rhythm. It plays a role in what is called phase separation. Doris Lowe, Dr. Russell Ryder, they talk about this. What is phase separation? So within cellular biology, we have membrane-bound organelle, like the mitochondria, but then we also have like self-aggregating proteins, which can be good things and bad things, things that would we wouldn't want within the cell. It could be viruses that start to aggregate. It could be amyloid that starts to aggregate. Melatonin can interfere and help regulate phase separation in the cell. So you could say, well, that's connected, it would seem to aging, immune health, and yes. And then um, finally, you know, to kind of be thinking again about the brain, melatonin exhibits so many neurotrophic-like effects, you know, so it can promote healthy nerve cell differentiation, proliferation, you know, just like the health of the nerve cell. Uh, it can also, in fact, if you look at the research, most of it stacks up for cognition and central nervous system health. Secondly, immune health. So it's overall helping with modulating the production of neuroantioxidants. It's helping to increase dendrite complexity. It's helping with the nerve growth maturation, you know, the different uh, cell types within the brain and within the central nervous system are being helped with melatonin. It can help to um, promote brain neuroplasticity. And, you know, there was even, now a lot of this is still, you know, how do you do this in humans? You can't. Right. You've got to look in cell models and in animal studies. There has been some preclinical work showing that 
melatonin may actually be helpful in preventing any kind of leaky blood brain barrier, right? So in functional mm -hmm. medicine, we, we know a lot about leaky gut. We talk about leakiness, leaky mitochondria. You know, we don't want membranes to be all leaky because that's what creates an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so as it turns out, you know, some of the preclinical work would suggest that melatonin can help to decrease the permeability of that blood brain barrier, which I think is kind of interesting. So, you know, I, so I, you know, probably for most people thinking about it, they're like, oh, wow, this sounds like a miracle molecule. Um, the thing with melatonin though, is that children produce the most amount of melatonin. So let's just say from three months on, especially if a baby is breastfed by a with milk that is enriched in the mother's melatonin. So therefore she should be nursing at night or pumping at night so that she can, yes, because then that melatonin will help to fortify the gut microbiome, get that child better regulated from a circadian Whoa. rhythm perspective, better sleep for her, better sleep for the child, right? So from that time, and note that formulas that you buy in the store, you know, they don't, have added melatonin. So that is something that just endogenously will take some time to be produced. So if we look at kids, you know, from the age of three months to puberty, they have the highest melatonin they're going to have their whole lives. That is it. That is like their biggest bank account of melatonin. Now from puberty on, what happens is melatonin starts to go down. And by the time we are in middle age, let's just say we're in our 30s, we're about 35, you know, at, let's just say the pineal gland as a child, we're producing about a milligram, one milligram. Now we're in middle age, we're producing about 0 0.3 milligrams from the pineal gland. Now we get into our 50s, we're making about 0 0.1 milligrams, right? So 10 times less. So it just gets... You know, as we go through life, we go through what could be referred to as melatonopause, where we are going much like estrogen is tanking, progesterone is tanking, testosterone is tanking, so is melatonin, and so is the rise of what? You know, chronic diseases. So then people start to think, well, should I be replenishing my melatonin? And you know, we can talk about the different ways to do that. I kind of have like a hierarchical system of how I would do that clinically. Yeah, I would love to hear that actually. That's, uh, uh, I mean, so many questions I have about all the things that you just said, but but I think it's, it's great just to move forward into going into, okay, if people want to take it, then how do you kind of think through that? Because there is so many, I mean, you go to a natural health store and yeah. what what do you choose, you know? And so it's so hard for people to kind of sort through that. Uh, so how how do you how do you go through that in your own yes. process? Yeah, absolutely. And again, this was education on my part. And again, in full disclosure, I work with a company that makes a plant melatonin. It's natural. It's right from the plants. It's not synthetic. 99% of the melatonin on the market, like if you buy it through Amazon or you go into that health store that you're talking about, it's been synthesized from chemicals, like different chemicals. It's gone through the processing because what we learned very early on in the 1950s is that it would take about 2,500 pineal glands from animals to create 100 milligrams of melatonin. Well, that's not feasible. And then you have to think, oh. well, what about viruses? What about prions? That's all problematic, right? So right. what what started to happen is that this started to undergo chemical synthesis. Now you could say, well, is that really a problem? I mean, what's wrong with that? Well, if it's pure, it's not a problem. But what we could see as a part of that process that you can start to get contaminants that could be part of a synthetic melatonin if people, different companies are not careful. And so what I like, so with plant melatonin, which the kind that I use is called herbatonin, it's from rice, chlorella, and alfalfa. And in a study that was published in 2021 in the Molecules Journal, researchers looked at herbatonin versus synthetic melatonin. 
and they found that across the board it outperformed the synthetic melatonin even though the melatonin was identical the herbatonin had other things in it from the plant that seemed to be synergistic. So in general, anti-inflammatory activity was increased by 646% with the herbatonin. The free radical scavenging, this was in a cell model, was increased up to 470%. Then they also looked in a skin cell line and found that the reactive oxygen species were down 100% with the herbatonin. And then the ORAC value, the antioxidant value that sometimes is used, is up to 10 times greater with the herbatonin. So for all of the biohackers, longevity seekers, all of these people, like if you're going to take a melatonin, you might as well take the best. A lot of them out there are synthetic. Some of them are with other ingredients that could actually change the metabolism of melatonin in such a way to not have such a good effect. Some of them are in, um, you know, like a bottle with the lid. And so melatonin can break down in air because of the oxygen, um, right? It's an so if you just have like a bottle that you just keep taking your melatonin, you don't know what you're getting by that you're at the the bottom of that bottle, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not a fan of giving children all of these melatonin gummies. I think that that's a problem. And I think that, you know, the dose is also really important. How we take it, when we take it, the amount that we take, we also need to talk about that. But, um, you know, we have to think about the packaging. So again, that's why like all of these things are very deliberate. And if you're trying to get that amount, like, let's just say you're 40 years old, and you're already starting to think like, oh, my gosh, you know, my body's starting to change. I want to optimize my aging process. Everybody ages. Let's just do it well. You know, how do you fill the gap? Well, all you need is a very low dose. You know, some people are taking like skyrocketed double digit doses. So you're taking like 20, 30, 40. Yeah. 50. Yeah. And, and those are not verified, validated, you know, from a right. safety perspective, I get a little bit concerned about double digits over a long period of time, just because we don't have the data. Anything above 10 milligrams, we right. don't have good safety data. But come on, if we look at physiologic doses that would mirror what the pineal gland is making, and we take it at night, like, you know, mirroring that pineal gland amount, then you know, it has a greater safety margin. So 0 0.3 milligrams, which would coincide with what we were making in middle age, right? So we, we still have kind of like a low baseline that we're making, like probably 0 0.1. But I got to say, you know, for some people there, they may even be even lower. You know, if we think yeah. of artificial blue light at night, and often I say, before you jump into a, a melatonin supplement, get your light right, get your darkness right, get your eyes exposed to bright light first thing in the morning, because that will also promote healthy melatonin at night. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I wear blue light blocking glasses when I'm on the um, computer late at night. I try to avoid that, by the way. But if I'm on my phone, I make sure that our house lights are dim. Because mm -hmm. when it's nighttime. That's when your body is starting to amp up in melatonin from the pineal gland. That's called the dim light melatonin onset. But we can overturn that if we've got all the fluorescent lights are on, we're in the gym working out, thinking we're getting all healthy. But in actuality, we're, we're suppressing our endogenous melatonin. And if you have light eyes, you know, I have green eyes. And so I have to tend to that even more. People with green blue and light brown eyes actually have greater melatonin suppression at night when they're exposed to artificial blue light. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody with dark brown eyes uh, doesn't have that suppression, but you have to be really diligent about your light exposure at night and making sure that you get bright light in the morning. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree. I think I, I've been really mindful. I've probably in the past four years about sleep hygiene and like getting the music, the lighting, everything down. I mean, it's made such a big difference. And especially when you look at the data, <clears throat> we were at an event in, in, in Canada, and we and when you look at the data of not sleeping, increased risk of cancer, cognitive yes. disease. I mean, I mean, it just, 
the data on that is just remarkable. Um, you know, we we could even just look at people who do shift work. Yes. You know, you know, right there, we know of the studies and the increased rates mm -hmm. for certain kinds of cancer, especially breast cancer, right? Yeah. And then think about people who have flip-flop routines, like maybe an x-ray technician who is in darkness most of the day, or people who work in a mine, you know, with mm -hmm. darkness, you know? So if we don't start with the light in the dark, I feel like that is, that's the operating system. And then from that, we go into the food, we go into the supplements, we go into, you know, activity. But if we don't get the light right and the dark right, we're missing a big part of our health. Yes, absolutely. And then you mentioned that um, the melatonin, the first thing to think about is that, okay, you don't want a synthetic and 99% of them out there are synthetic, meaning that they um, are made in a lab. And then, so so one percent of the supplements out there are not synthetic and are actually from a natural source, which correct plants or and, and algae and and things like that, huh? Yes, and that would be preferred. You know, make sure that whoever you choose, and you and I know this because we're both in functional medicine. We know that you've got to put a dietary supplement to the scrutiny, to the test. Oh, I've been sure. in the dietary supplement industry for a long time, and. You know, what you don't know um, is it can be a big thing, right? So mm -hmm. you want to be sure that you've got a quality supplement that they tested back to what you were saying for heavy metals, for contaminants, right? All of that is, is essential. Um, making sure that the packaging is well equipped. Mm -hmm. And again, that's just another reason why. And I don't like to have other things in there with my melatonin, right? So with mm -hmm. Herbitonin, it is just the melatonin. It's not like you're, but you are also getting whatever is in there from the plants just naturally, but mm -hmm. you're not adding in things like L-theanine or magnesium or, you know, valerian or, you know, some of these things um, can change the metabolism of melatonin. Caffeine can change the metabolism of melatonin. So, um, and melatonin actually goes through liver uh, metabolic biotransformation pathways. So it goes through cytochrome 1A2. So much like some other substrates, it kind of, you know, it can be impacted by people that are taking medications, people taking certain herbs. So I think it's best to take melatonin, like herbitonin, like an hour before bedtime and take it with, you know, maybe like a little bit of fat you know, just because it is fat soluble, but it's also water soluble. So you can also take it with water, okay. but just take it about an hour before bedtime. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people take this even if they don't have sleep issues, right? You don't need mm -hmm. a sleep issue to take melatonin. It's really about, you know, for me, I don't, you know, going through perimenopause, I actually did have a sleep issue. So I needed mm -hmm. to lean on melatonin a little bit more to help me to, one thing I didn't mention is that melatonin lowers your core body temperature. So for perimenopausal women, what happens? Mm. Your temperature gets dysregulated, right? They start mm. having hot flashes, night sweats. And um, so I had to really be diligent about my melatonin, as well as like my routine and what I was doing so I could quell that nighttime heat. So, you know, as it gets dark, it starts to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. We start to produce more and more melatonin. And what ends up happening, if people are really in tune with their bodies, they'll notice that they get a little chill at night. You know, I know for me at about 9 p.m., mm -hmm. I, I feel like I need to put on my jammies. You know, I, I'm cold. I, I need to go to bed. That's melatonin. Melatonin mm -hmm. is a hypothermic agent. And we know in the longevity space that there's so much about using heat, mm -hmm. using cold. Mm -hmm. And if we are not inflamed, right, we don't have all this heat. We're kind of bringing the body into that quelled temperature zone that is conducive for sleep. And you hear that all the time about how people... You know, you, when you talk about sleep hygiene, you know, one of the things is getting the temperature right in the room, but we also have an inner body temperature, which can be modulated and regulated through melatonin. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. One of the questions that is popping into my mind is in the hospital, we use melatonin a lot. It's actually one of the supplements that we use the most in the hospitals. But I always wonder nowadays, I mean, now with methylation medicine and epigenetic medicine coming out and pharmacogenomics, I wonder if there was any, if you had any thoughts about 
why does it work for some people? Why doesn't it work for some people? Some people are given melatonin and the next morning, and even he's like a three milligram dose. And they're all like, I had the best night of my life. You know, I the best sleep of my life. And then some people, this doesn't work. Then you give them six. It doesn't work. Um, and like you say, you know, going higher and higher in doses really doesn't doesn't seem to be, from my experience, to help a lot. So do you have any thoughts about that? Why does it work for some people? Why does it work for other people? Do we have any insights on that yet? Melatonin may not be their issue. You know, there are many reasons why people sleep poorly. I'm assuming that in the hospital, you're using it for sleep, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, many issues relating to sleep. It's not always a melatonin issue. Again, melatonin is more than sleep. It's sleep by way of the circadian rhythm. But, you know, there could be a blood sugar issue. Right. There can be an over toxicity issue. There can be a medication issue. There can be uh, postural or pain issues that could underlie a lot of sleep disturbance. So it's not, sleep is not always a melatonin issue. And that's, that's also what I'm saying too about, you know, you can take it for sleep to see if that would be warranted, but there are other reasons to be taking it, you know, as the antioxidant. And when you said that at the hospital, you know, giving them three milligrams, that may be, actually be overshooting what they need. Interesting. They may, they may need a more physiologic dose. Some people, if you give them too much or their metabolism is in such a way, or maybe it's the format of the melatonin supplement, like I don't know what this melatonin that you're using is. Right. You could actually be uh, working at cross purposes where it's like it's too much or their body is metabolizing it too quickly or there's something in it that may not be good. You know, I, wow. I always think when you when you mentioned pharmacokinetics, to me, it's like the Goldilocks principle, not too little, not too much, just right for the person. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think starting with a low dose, I mean, you're mentioning a dose that's much higher than I would even begin to be thinking about, I would just be going with the 0 0.3 milligrams mirroring what we know is typically produced by the pineal gland. And then if that doesn't work, you know, you know, you have to kind of do an intake on sleep hygiene and all of the things around sleep. Like I know in hospitals, the lighting is poor. You know, they keep bright lights on all the time. I mean, maybe it's just starting with dimming the the light in the hospital room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, people in hospitals, they're bombarded with light. They're bombarded with technology all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like, who can sleep in a hospital? I can't yeah. imagine that. I'd rather be at home. It's super hard. And there's all kinds of studies and designs that are coming up uh, now from architects designing around this problem. Thank goodness. The Thank lighting, goodness. the sound, yeah. the alarms. Actually, patients that are in a window bed, they have a length of stay average 1.5 days sooner than patients that don't. So, yeah, there's all these design problems that I think we have to solve to be able to get people the, the 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 sleep that they mentioned. And I think our last question as we wrap up is two questions. The first one is, you mentioned uh, metabolic health. So I know there's been, uh, there's quite a lot of studies on me uh, uh, melatonin and diabetes and metabolic health and how we can actually help patients with these chronic conditions. Um, and then the last question would be just like, what's next for you and what you're, uh, and what, it, what are you excited about working on the future? Oh, that's a great, <clears throat> great two questions to close on. So metabolic, uh, impacts. Well, first of all, I, I think, um, you know, there was a study that I just came across and I just posted on my social media and it was, um, that wearing blue light blocking glasses, this was in healthy men. So they didn't have metabolic disruption, but they wore blue light block blocking glasses two to three hours before bedtime for one month. And there were improvements in their fasting plasma glucose and their HOMA score, which is a measure of basically insulin resistance and sensitivity. So that was just from wearing blue light blocking glasses that wasn't even taking oh. melatonin. But we do know that melatonin uh, as a neurohormone is connected into other hormones like cortisol and insulin. So, and there are receptors on the cells for melatonin. And so I, I do think that looking at 
metabolism is 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 really key when we're talking about melatonin because there is some evidence that melatonin supplementation not only can help regulate things like body weight and metabolic parameters especially in animal studies but also to help with the perturbations that can occur because of that skewed circadian rhythm so it's almost like it helps it is so for a shift worker who may have more cardiometabolic issues because they have flip-flopped their circadian rhythm, melatonin can actually help to uh, reduce or even reverse in some cases some of those perturbations. And that that has been um, you know discussed in a variety of different studies and, and papers. You know, there was one that was published on chrononutrition and they talked about melatonin for that particular reason. So it's pretty robust. And I think it can help us from a metabolic perspective and, you know, how well our mitochondria is working. Maybe we have mitochondrial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And I've talked with Dr. Terry Walls about this, who mm -hmm. is really big into minding the mitochondria, right? She takes melatonin. And we were talking about, you know, the pivotal role of, you know, mitophagy, autophagy, you know, and having the, the mitochondria to to help with regulating a lot of the the spray of kind of the the, the debris that relates from the the metabolism right all of these different pathways so that would be my my final <laughs> comment on metabolism as far as me personally gosh you know I I'm always going to be playing in the playground of plants I feel that you know, I'm I'm actually going to be presenting at the Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Conference, which is in a couple of weeks. This is Dr. Jeffrey Bland's meeting, his annual meeting every year. And I'm going to be talking about actually everything that we talked about. I'm going to be talking about the role of seasons. I'm going to talk about chronobiotic agents in food. I'm going to talk about plant melatonin. I'm going to talk about how plants can help to signal us through mm. the phytochemicals to be more in line with our rhythms. So mm. I'll be talking at the IFM meeting. Um, I'll be talking, you know, this has just become more and more a part of everything that I'm doing because I really just, I, I can't overlook the significance of it. You know, food is one thing and food is massive for our health, right? Food is medicine, food is healing. It's all of those things. But the food is determined by the circadian aspects of the planet. And the dynamic of that food within us is to a large degree determined by circadian rhythm as well. So I'm excited because it brings the element of time of day and night uh, into eating. And it, it just adds another overlay to everything I'm doing. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to be about for the next year or so. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's such an important message, I think, nowadays, because everybody is trying to figure out how to live a better day and also have a better night, you know? And yes. So, uh, and so it just kind of ties it all together uh, and, and doing something that is natural and that is being, is an ancient molecule, like you mentioned. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, really it's not exciting. new. Yeah. yeah. It's not. And so if somebody wants to get that herbatonin, where should they go? Yeah, they can go. I mean, it's on Amazon. Um, they it. can just go right to the website, symphonynaturalhealth.com. Um, feel free to, for anybody listening, feel free to email me if you have questions about melatonin. Um, you know, there's also a medical team at Symphony Natural Health and they can get into the nuance. Like if you prescribe this to patients and you want to understand more, you know, that is also available. So yeah. And otherwise I'm available on social media. I just made a few posts on melatonin actually, like, cause I, I really do think it's important to get the education out there. I think that some people are afraid of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's because they don't understand that there's like a spectrum of what melatonin is using. And it definitely takes a long time to translate science into clinical use, right? So I think the mm -hmm. the sooner we can get out there and do that, and that's why I want to thank you for having me on your podcast, because I feel like, you know, hopefully this will help people to have a better understanding of melatonin. I would also say if you can put the review article in the show notes so people can look at it and, mm -hmm. you know, there are charts in there. So it's easy for clinicians where they don't want to read all the science. They're like, just tell me what to do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, there are a bunch of charts in that paper where they can just look at, okay, 
here are the doses, here are the different clinical indications, everything from reproductive health, gastrointestinal health, immune health, you know, it's all there in the paper. So I would say you can lean on that. For sure. Yeah, we'll put that and then the uh, all the, all the websites that you mentioned. Awesome. Definitely. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure getting to chat with you.